I think that it's important to remember that Mother Nature doesn't follow those rules of society and she takes all the time that she wants. And no matter, you know, how fast you think things need to happen, she does it her own way. Welcome to the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast, inspiring real women with a passion for fishing in the outdoors to go get their adventure on. Now, here's your host, coming to you from the Lance Chuck Camper Mobile Podcast Studio, Master Captain Angie Scott. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Woman Angler and Adventurer Podcast. This week we're continuing on with our revisited series uh, centered around women and hunting. And I am currently down on Logan Martin Lake practice fishing for the big LBA Classic that starts in a couple days. I'll be sure and keep you guys posted on how it goes. Um, exciting stuff. So anyways, um, this time we're going to go all the way back to episode number 35, where I interviewed an amazing lady named April Willis, and she's big into hunting and health as well. And she shared with us seven great tips to increase your hunting performance with Huntress Health. And uh, it was funny when when we recorded this episode originally, and this was back in um, 2018. It was right after Thanksgiving, so it couldn't have been more fitting to talk about health. Um, But she has some really great tips for everybody that's uh, really interested in, you know, keeping, staying in your best health um, to better perform when you're out in the field hunting or fishing. I mean, it applies to any kind of outdoor activities. Um, but I think you guys will get some value from this. And so I'm excited to reshare this episode with y'all this week. And uh, we'll see what happens at the classic. Like I said, I'll keep you posted. Until then, enjoy this episode. April, it's an honor to have you as a guest on the Woman Angler and Adventure podcast. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I am so excited to be here. On this episode, April's going to share with us her seven super important tips to increase your hunting performance. She's put together a really nice PDF outlining these tips. And in case you're not in a spot where you're able to take notes, you'll be able to access this. Uh, There'll be a link to it in the show notes and also a link to where you can access it on the womanangler.com website. But before we dig into all that, I know our listeners would love to know more about you and Huntress Health, which is a really cool concept. So to start off, would you mind just tell us a little bit about how you got into hunting? Sure. Um, I definitely got into hunting because of my dad. Um, My mom's family um, owned about 160 acres of farmland that's nestled right up against our provincial park here in Manitoba. And my dad, you know, through some friends of his when they were young, they got together and he was really excited because he, you know, kind of like got himself into this land, this perfect hunting land. And, you know, from, from that, you know, obviously they had me and my dad just, I'm an only child. And the only opportunity had that he had to take his child with him was, you know, when mom wasn't around and when the family wasn't around or when mom would let me. And that's literally how it all started was, Dad used to dress me up in a purple snowsuit, and I remember that one like super vividly. I remember sleeping on the bottom of a tree stand that my dad had made hunting over um, a really pretty alfalfa field, and we were hunting for elk. And that's kind of where it started. You know, he had me tag along with him to everything that he would do because mom would be away at work. And, you know, it was either he stayed home with me or he took me. And that's, you know, that's how I guess I kind of fell in love with the outdoors in the woods. So at what point did you start actually getting into hunting yourself, not just kind of tagging along with your dad? Well, here uh, in Manitoba, we're not allowed to hunt 
you know, until you're 12. You have to have your hunter safety for any kind of firearm. So I technically didn't start hunting on my own until I was 12. And I remember the year that I started hunting, my dad had like this perfect setup all figured out. And I remember him saying over and over again, behind the shoulder, shoot behind the shoulder, shoot behind the shoulder. And we had practiced like where vitals were for deer forever and ever and ever. And he kept saying it to me, saying it to me, saying it to me. And my first deer was like a perfect, like over the hill. He came up and over the hill and came just slightly down the hill, stopped to like perfectly broadside just as it was getting into evening and everything was amazingly perfect. Wow. Yeah. Now, was that, <laughs> was that your very first year? Yep. That wow. was my very first year, my very first buck. And then it, it went on to be a, like a competition between me and my dad every year as to who could shoot a bigger buck. Because <laughs> that, that year I shot a really nice, I believe, like up here we say five by five, not how many points. Mm -hmm. So it was a really nice five by five that was really close to what my dad had. And the next year I had actually beat him and so it's been a competition ever since. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So before you turned 12, were you already kind of like chomp chomping at the bit, like couldn't wait to actually start? Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, we, I had gone with him all the time and he would take me the craziest places. Uh, I remember one tree stand that I, he had a specific name for, and I don't remember the name anymore. But he would get me all ready to go and, and we would all be ready. And I, I knew kind of which spots were, you know, the best and where the bigger deer like to kind of, you know, hang out and funnel from the, from the hills and the provincial park. And I remember there was one spot that I just hated going to because it was the, the highest tree stand he had ever made. And he always made me sit in the higher one and he would sit in the lower one. And it was in like some spindly little tamarack and it would shake like crazy in the trees. And I hated going, but I loved going because I knew that's where the big deer were. And I knew like if I went with him every year, I would know what was going on there. And, you know, then the, the year that I would be able to hunt, I would know which were the big deer and where they were and where they were moving. And, and, you know, I would have all of, all of dad's ideas in my head. Yeah. Well, sounds like it paid off. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get into the, you know, the reason why we're having this conversation and that's because you do something really cool uh, called Huntress Health, where you've kind of put together uh, fitness specifically for uh, women who are into hunting and like what they need to do to be in shape to have a successful hunting season. And I, I want to know like what led you to this uh, awesome idea? Well, there were, there was really two things. The first thing was one of my own hunts. And the second was a program that I had thought would be great and wasn't. So the, the buck situation was, um, when I had met my husband, my now husband, um, I had moved into his house in the late fall and I had missed that hunting season. Mm -hmm. And I, like that year I had hunted with my dad at home and then I had moved in later in the season and miss that hunting season. So all of the next year before September, I had, you know, placed trail cameras. I had checked trails. I had watched the fields and I kind of had an idea of where the deer were coming and how things were going. And where we live, we're in kind of um, a sand hill area and there's quite a bit of hilly, quite a bit of hills and our place is in a valley. So we're on the south facing side of a valley and it's really beautiful. And if you kind of come around the fields, um, the valley, the edge of the valley continues. So I had this spot planned out. Me and my dad had, had found it and we placed a ground blind at the bottom. So I was sitting by myself at the bottom and uh, I heard a bunch of coyotes howling. And like howling and yipping and, and something was like they were getting closer. Something kind of wasn't right. Like their activity and their passion in it was just a little too much than it normally is. And for whatever reason, I really have no idea. 
when I think about it now, why I thought it would be smart to move. But I packed my bag and I grabbed my bow. I left the rest of my stuff in the blind and I ran straight up the side of the hill from the blind to the fence line and to the corner of it. And I knelt down and sure enough, this buck comes running out of the funnel in the corner and he comes up to the side of the fence line and he's on alert, like big time on alert. Ears are up, eyes are wide. He's looking all around and I let him step behind a tree and I drew my bow and I don't know, he, he like, he totally knew something was up because mm-hmm. he would not move. And I was in full draw on my knees behind like a fence post in a tree, just waiting for him to take like one or two steps out from behind the tree. It was a 20 yard shot. It was perfect. He was the biggest buck I had ever seen in my life in velvet. Like I'm, I'm positive. His tines must have been, you know, like eight inches or more. And he was in velvet and he was huge and he was wide. And I was in full draw. He took the two steps and I let it rip and I completely missed him. Mm. At 20 yards, my arrow went, I don't know, at least a foot underneath him, skid across the grass, way off to the side. And I had realized that my shoulder had got tired in full draw and I had put my cam on my knee. Mm. So I completely slowed down my bow and I completely missed him. And it was one of those moments where I, was upset with myself for missing, you know, how do I tell my dad that I missed the biggest buck of my life when he had taught me so much over the years and, you know, just like, how did you let yourself get to this position where you can't even shoot a deer? (laughs) So I was sad with myself. I was mad with myself. I was kind of all the emotions trying to keep it all in and just be like, all right, let's pack it up and get going. So at that point you're thinking, you know, if you had prepared a little bit more like physically that maybe you would have been able to hold out a little longer without getting tired. Yeah, exactly. And that's when I kind of, I started looking on the internet and I was, you know, I follow a bunch of, you know, hunting pages and stuff like that. And I had kind of found, um, a hunting page that on Facebook that, is geared towards fitness for hunting. And I was really excited about it. It was run by a gentleman and, you know, he had a group and they were looking for like pro staff and the, and you had to, you know, do the program to be part of the pro staff. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, this is sweet. Like, you know, would you consider somebody from Canada? Like I gotta, I, you know, gotta get my strength up and my endurance up and, you know, be able to pull more pounds and hold and stuff like that. And they're, yeah, no problem. Canada's fine. And so it was a three, three times payment. And, you know, you got your program, you got a Facebook group and you were in and you would do your stuff and you would post in the Facebook group. And there was no coaching, no motivational stuff, no one-to-ones or anything like that. And I thought, okay, sweet. So I paid for, you know, my one third of my payment. I got my program and right off the hop, I knew something was wrong because I received the program as like a forward. So they had emailed it to me and it had been forwarded through like three or four people. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, that's not very professional. I don't like that. And then I got into the Facebook group and it turned into like, uh, like a bro's bicep competition. It was like, who's got the biggest bicep, who can lift the most weight, who's got the biggest lats and, and the biggest traps and who can, you know, look like a Mr. Olympia kind of thing. And, and I was just, Oh my gosh, this so isn't for me. Like if I tell them that I am a female, which they clearly know by my name and I say that I can only lift, you know, 35 pounds or whatever, they're going to think I'm crazy. And I just, it it wasn't, there was no help. There was no coaching. There was no like live coaching calls. Nobody ever called me and said, you know, how are you doing? How are you feeling here? How's your program going? How's your nutrition? Nothing. Mm -hmm. And I got myself out of the program. I didn't pay for the rest of it. I walked out and I said, I said to myself, April, you have 
two bachelor degrees. You have a certification in nutrition. You know what you're talking about. You know how to properly create a program that's not all about back and biceps, like a well-balanced, well-rounded program that includes recovery and injury rehabilitation and nutrition. You can make this. Like you can make it and you can make it for women so that they feel comfortable and they feel safe in this space. So you have a website and you have an awesome uh, Facebook group. And uh, what other, like, what can people expect if they want to get involved in Huntress Health? Well, I do, I have an online, a membership site kind of off of um, Facebook. And in there, I've got a bunch of free stuff. Like I give away a lot of free things like little, little challenges, meal plans, um, different sorts of bits that you can take and consume really quickly and kind of get a quick win of it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And then I've also got some free challenges and I have two programs and I'm working on an academy right now. And the academy is for women who are, you know, ready and they're serious about getting their performance to a level that they you know, needs. So the women who want to do a backcountry elk hunt, or you're going to do a pack and a hike session, or, you know, you're planning to, I'm not sure, you know, go pheasant hunting and you're planning on shouldering your gun, you know, 200 times in a, in a weekend. And you just don't think that you have the strength for that, but you really know that you want to get there and you want your performance to be at that level. That's what the Academy is, is for, you know, to help women lose weight, get stronger and learn how to use recovery tactics and nutrition really to their advantage to get to that level that they want to be at. That's, that's what I'm focusing on right now. It sounds like, you know, I've, I've heard it said something to the effect of where passion and purpose collide. That's where the magic happens. And I feel like that's kind of what's going on with you and, and putting your passion for hunting together with your passion for health and fitness. Um, and so that, that's, that's such a cool thing. So I want to get into these seven tips because I know a lot of listeners <coughs> out there in, in our Facebook group, the woman angler group are looking for, tips uh, going into hunting season on how they can prepare to, you know, have the endurance you're talking about and um, not just physically, but mentally as well. And you kind of touch on that in these seven tips. So I want to, I want to jump into that if you wouldn't mind and, uh, you know, just start going through the first one is work out right. And can you explain what you mean by that? For sure. So um, by working out right, I mean, working out in a way that gets your body actually ready for the goal that you want to accomplish. So, you know, for example, if you plan on doing a 60 mile hike, um, working out only to gain, you know, 10 miles isn't going to do it for you or say doing all upper body bicep curls and tricep extensions and stuff isn't really what you want to focus on, you want to focus on getting your legs ready. So your legs and your cardio. So doing workouts that help get your body ready for the goal that you actually want to accomplish. You know, if you want to do a train to hunt challenge or the um, total archery challenge, and you know that you're going to be like slinging over a hundred arrows in a weekend, you need to get yourself up to that actual goal and not sell yourself short. You know, and, and hunters and outdoors people really need to focus on whole body approaches for your strength and your endurance, your proprioception, your cardiovascular system. And that helps build like all of the areas. And, you know, I, I see it a lot of times where you're being told, like, just shoot more arrows, just shoot more arrows, just work on your upper body, just shoot more arrows. Well, that doesn't help you if you're going to be in the backwoods and you're going to be packing and you know, you're, you need a whole body kind of system going and you need to work out those areas that are really going to be helpful and beneficial to you. And yeah, I love the whole body approach. Cause I think that's, that's super important. Even, you know, I'm Barb, my co-host and myself, you know, we're into fishing and I kind of think the same thing applies to that because, 
a whole day of fishing can wear you down pretty quickly. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to steady yourself in the boat and you're casting and reeling and, you know, all this stuff and bending over. And so, yeah, I think that's excellent advice. I didn't actually realize how tough fishing would actually be on the body. This last weekend was Thanksgiving here in Canada, and uh, a friend and I went on a fly fishing trip, and we were using like a duck boat with um, uh, platforms on it, Mm -hmm. and we were fly fishing, and we did three, three lakes and four sessions. Uh, so we went to one lake twice and we did two other lakes over the weekend and my rhomboids, my lats and my shoulder, my rotator cuff were so sore from fly fishing and the bottom of my feet from like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like your toes curling into like, make yourself, I don't know. Like, I feel like I had suction cups to the top of the platform or something. I was so sore and I didn't even realize I should know better. But I didn't realize that it would be like that. Yeah, totally. And and for me, it tends to like, for some reason, my back gets sore the fastest. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I definitely need to work on probably some back strengthening exercises. Another thing, too, with the working out right is it's really important to to begin by creating a base of strength. Like lots of people think, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to pick up the weights and I'm going to get into like full on functional. I'm going to do burpees and like box jumps and I'm going to do like sandbag carries and tire flips and stuff like that. It's really important when people are getting into the idea of working out for hunting or outdoors that they start with a creating a base of strength so that you can protect your muscles and your joints and then moving into those motion exercises and the functional training tasks that you can incorporate your chosen activity into. So it's good to, you know, be slow and and work your way up to the really hard stuff that you see the really cool people doing. Yeah, I imagine that really helps prevent injury, which is the last thing you want. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, you know, as an athletic therapist, I I always say to people, I say, I love to see you come in to see me because I get to help you, but I never want to see you again. (laughs) Yes. And that's just, you know, I don't want you to get hurt again. So if you can do your training in such a way that, you know, helps you protect yourself and work your way up, then I never have to see you. And that's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Well, with that, let's move into tip number two, which is eat right. And you kind of have a cool approach behind that. Would you explain that a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Um, So eat right um, for me is like another, you know, practice eating in a way that complements your goals and routines. And, and for me, my approach to it, um, in my, I have, it's what's called the wild method. And what I teach in there is that you want to try eating cleaner, healthier, more organic wild meats and homegrown vegetables. And that have the most healthiest nutrients to assist you with, all of your goals, right? Like muscle production, hormone regulation, weight loss, and recovery. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that idea, especially for people who are into the outdoors. I think it's only natural to kind of feed yourself with those types of foods. Yeah. And I really, um, you know, some people are going to say that I'm crazy for this, but I, I don't steer people into, you know, keto or intermittent fasting or paleo or anything like that. I really believe in starting with a balanced approach, getting carbs, proteins, and healthy fats at every meal, because that can really, really change things for a lot of people that can help, you know, help them lose weight, help them start to produce muscle, help them get their hormones regulated. And then once people actually understand how to fuel themselves properly with macro, like the three macros, how to eat properly, how to eat slowly, how to eat mindfully, and they get it all figured out, that's when you can press into keto, paleo, intermittent fasting, primal, and all those things. Your body, when you are used to the standard American diet, the food that you're eating is not complementing your goals. 
especially if you're starting to work out, you're trying to gain muscle and you're trying to lose weight. Standard American diet is not complementing that. And the easiest thing for people to do to get started eating right is just look at balancing. Just look at getting the three macronutrients into every meal, you know, create that simple change. And then once you've really got that down, then you can start tweaking and start modifying for like increased, you know, muscle building, increased muscle performance and, you know, even more weight loss and, you know, increasing that performance even more. Yeah. I love that approach too, because people that just jump into these kind of crazy, more extreme diets like keto or paleo or whatever, everybody is different. And so unless I think you start with a balanced nutrition and approach when you start trying these things you don't really know if it's working great for you or not you know exactly yeah and there's that's exactly why I start balance is because I have no problem with keto or keto or paleo or intermittent fasting no problems with them at all it's just that people don't they jump into them and they don't really, they say, Oh man, I can lose so much weight with this because my friend did it, Mm -hmm. but they don't actually understand, you know, what do you do after 21 days of keto or paleo or after you're done the whole 30, they don't have that mindset of mindful and purposeful eating down first. And once you get that figured out and you know, okay, I'm eating balanced meals and I'm just not finding that it's working the way that I really want it to, you know, maybe I'm, f- I'm getting some changes in my weight and some changes in my performance, but I really want to get that more. That's when you can tweak and that's when you can move into keto and paleo and people understand actually why they're doing it and they can continue with it and make it a whole lifestyle change and habit change. Have you found that some people though, just do really well, just sticking with that balanced routine and not really having to try some of these other more extreme diets? Yeah, definitely. And a lot of people just like not having to figure out more, not having to, the thing about balanced, you know, balanced macros is like, okay, this thing is a carb, this thing is a fat, and this thing is a protein. I put one of each on my plate and it's done. Mm-hmm. I don't have to measure it. I don't have to weigh it. I don't have to worry about a percentage. I don't have to pull out all my measuring cups, nothing. One of each thing on your plate, you know, are the proper portion size and that's it. Yeah. When you move into keto and paleo and things like that, you know, there's, there's counting, there's percentages, there's timing, there's weighing and, you know, cups and measuring spoons and all that kind of stuff. And some people just don't like that. And they go, you know what? I like the balanced approach and I find that I'm getting what I need from this I'll stay here. Yeah. Ready for some real fun in sportsman's paradise? Come explore everything the Louisiana Gulf has to offer with a charter fishing trip led by one of our state's top captains. With more than 7,000 miles of brimming coastline, Louisiana has something spectacular to offer every fisherman, whether you're a beginner or a pro. Go catching with Louisiana's best captains today by planning your next adventure at LouisianaCharterFishing.com. That's LouisianaCharterFishing.com. For me, I think that that's probably what works best for me. Personally, I've tried some of the other things, and um, I don't know. I just feel the best when I'm I'm sticking with the balanced approach. So, But like I said, everybody's different, and you just got to try it and see what works best for you. Exactly. So just as important as the... The working out right and the eating right is tip number three, recover properly. Can you talk mm-hmm. about what you mean by that? Sure. Um, recovery, when I talk about recovery, it's, um, you know, giving your body a rest, but doing things like, you know, walking and maybe some biking or going um, swimming, going in the hot tub, doing some foam rolling. Those are all ways to recover. You can add nutrition in that too. But recovery is when you give your muscles and your joints and ligaments a chance to heal and adapt to the new stress that you've put on it. Your body doesn't get stronger in the workout. Your body gets stronger in the recovery process. And so, you know, you need to think and take a moment to think about how well you want your body to recover, right? If you give your cells junk to deal with, to try to heal, what can you expect out of that, right? 
Mm-hmm. Um, and without a good, without a good recovery process, your body just continues to break down your own tissue, right? Your body needs energy and oxygen and protein to rebuild the muscles that you broke down in a workout. And so if you aren't giving it time to recover and you're not giving it nutrients to recover, then it can't do that. And it, it throws you into a downward spiral of stress hormones and cortisol. And you think, you know, that you're working out really hard and you're doing really well, but you're downward spiraling because you're not recovering properly. Yeah, I imagine probably part of that too plays plays into that is like getting adequate sleep each night. Um because yeah. I think you probably can recover somewhat uh, getting a good night's sleep with, you know, eight hours or whatever, you know, is is the right amount of sleep for you. Mm-hmm. Um, how often do you recommend people take take like a recovery day? <clears throat> Honestly, it's super varied. Um, some people like to do a split, like an upper body day, a lower body day, then take a rest day. Some people like to do you know, Monday workout, Tuesday rest, Wednesday workout, Thursday rest. And that's something that you really have to, it's individual for everybody. And that's why you really need to have somebody that can talk to you one-on-one or coach you through it. And, you know, programs that have weekly coaching sessions where you can say to your coach, you know what, like, I'm, I feel like I'm doing awesome. I have so much energy the next day. Can I take one rest day away a week? Or somebody says, you know what, I'm working out two days in a row and then I'm getting that recovery day. And on the third day, I'm just not, you know, I'm not there and I don't have the energy and I can't complete the workouts and I'm so sore. You know, those people, you know, your, your coach needs to be able to recognize those and change their recovery for each person. You know, I recommend at least two, maybe even three recovery sessions per week. And a recovery session can be just, you know, walking, biking, stretching, foam rolling. Like you're still doing activity and task, but you're not breaking down muscle so much. And it gives your body still a chance to kind of repair. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so recovery isn't necessarily laying on the couch uh, eating chips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You still want to definitely get your good nutrition in there so that you can help your body recover because it needs all that nutrients. It requires energy to recover. Awesome. All right. So tip number four, I'm really glad that you included this in there because it doesn't necessarily have to do with working out or nutrition, but your tip number four is maintain a positive mindset. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I know I have a lot of people in my life who, um, don't quite have that positive mindset. Right. And, and that comes to me, it comes with a lot of patience. If you can be a patient person, you can maintain some positivity in your life. And it's really hard for us as people in this day and age on this planet, because we are so, so, so busy and everything is immediate, right? You get, Um, drive through food comes to you immediately. You can do all of your shopping online, drive up to the store and pick it up immediately. You know, Facebook, all of the updates are immediate. You're constantly seeing new things from new people. You know, your Facebook messenger and your text messages, you think you need everything immediately. We expect everything to come to us as fast as possible. And we're always like checking and rechecking to make sure that it does. And our patients just completely dwindles, um, with this kind of lifestyle. And I think that it's important to remember, you know, that mother nature doesn't follow those rules of society and she takes all the time that she wants. And no matter, you know, how fast you think things need to happen, she does it her own way. And so for people to maintain positivity and to continue to be patient is so, so important because I do know a lot of people who go out and sit and, you know, they saw an elk at four o'clock on Friday and they went out and they sat on Sunday and it is now four Oh five. And well, if the elk aren't here right now, they're not going to be here. So it's time to go. And 
that's just not being patient. And there, you know, when, when you're doing that and you're not being patient, your positivity just continues to go down. And, you know, then you don't want to go hunting and you don't like being there and the deer aren't there and woe is me and life is so rough and why is this so bad? And, but if you would just sit there and be positive, you know, the deer aren't here yet and the elk aren't here yet, but it's a beautiful day. And, you know, nature is so good to me and I have my health and I'm here and I'm able to do this. And keeping that positive mindset, you know, can, can keep you going for so much longer. Yeah. So are there, there any ways that people can like, you know, I hear, I hear about, you know, if, if you're surrounded by negative people, like eventually that kind of brings you down. So surround yourself with other positive people, um, maybe meditation or just having some quiet time every day to kind of just sit and be with your thoughts, you know, might help, uh, with positivity Definitely. And, and patience. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great tip. Another thing that I like to do now is, um, you know, I'll write a note for myself and I'll leave it in my house and I'll leave it in my vehicle and it will say, you know, be positive or think positive. And I'll put a notification on my phone that'll pop up and it'll be like, what can you find that's positive? And so, you know, even strange things such as you're driving down the highway and, oh my gosh, it gets dark so darn fast out here now mm -hmm. up in Canada. It's already like, it's already almost dark and it's only seven o'clock here. And, you know, you're mad because you're driving down the highway and it's dark. And I look at the note and I'm like, think of something positive. And you're like, you know what? I am so thankful and I am so happy that I have a vehicle that gets me from A to B and that has light for me to see in such darkness. Yep. You know, just thinking of those positive things constantly, creating positive thoughts in your head and you'll, you'll, keep, you'll keep thinking them. I know it sounds really woo woo and you know kind of off the off the wall but it it does work it does yeah i think it's something we just really have to work at and train our brains to shift from less negativity to more positivity and mm -hmm. uh, i don't know why it just seems like it's it's just like easier to just let yourself think negative and for some reason we have to work at reminding ourselves to be positive and hopefully the more we do it, the more that becomes habit and it, we'll just it's, help. it's something you've got to train into yourself. Just, you know, just like healthy eating habits and healthy workout habits and healthy recovery habits, you know, staying positive and continuing to think positive things, even, you know, when you're disappointed or you're in the feeling of anxiety or something like that, you, the more you can do it, the, the better it'll get, the more it'll bring you out of those negative thoughts and as you keep doing it, it just, the positivity just kind of starts to flow out of you and your thoughts kind of work their way to more positive things. All right. So I love, love, love tip number five, because it's so true. Find a tribe of like-minded women. Talk yeah. about that. Well, and this is kind of where, like, when I was, I've tried all the different, you know, like diets and wraps and pills and programs and things like that. And I have been in a group before where, you know, they said, tell us a little bit about yourself. And you're like, well, I'm from Manitoba and I like deer hunting and I like eating venison. And like everything just went downhill from that first comment. <laughs> you know, you're a hunter. How dare you? How could you do this? And, and I'm sitting there like, you guys don't understand. Like, you don't know what it's like to eat this amazing meat and do it yourself and, you know, be providing for a family and a, a marriage and your own household and doing it yourself and being independent and badass. And, and that, that didn't help at all. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm like, you know, having a group of people who know what you're going through, they can give you advice and insight. That's really like invaluable. And when it comes to hunting, finding a group of ladies either in person or online who you can share your struggles and your success with and who totally understand where you're coming from in, you know, your health and the fact that you're a hunter, that's amazing. And, you know, they can be so uplifting. Yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> so I'm glad to see that you have a Facebook group that people can join. And where can people go to find that? Um, if you go on to Facebook and you go pop in the search bar, the Facebook group is called the Huntress Health Community Weight Loss for Lady Hunters. 
Awesome. Yeah. So hopefully a lot of our listeners will hop over and join, um, you know, because it is so important to have a group uh, surrounding you, especially if you're going to go through a journey like this, uh, because, you know, it's going to require a lot of big changes in your life that, you know, you can start slowly, but uh, to have that encouragement and somewhere we can go where people understand exactly what you're trying to do is so important. Yeah. All right, so tip number six. We're wrapping it up here. We only got two more to go, and they're both very, very good tips. I love tip number six, prepare like you're there. Okay, so this one, I really like this one because I started working out in this kind of fashion. So if you're constantly standing taking 20-yard shots – uh, in a building or in your yard and you're always at 20 yards and you're like, yes, you know, I'm amazing at 20 yards. Then you move to a tree stand where you have to take a 30 yard shot seated and angled. It's going to throw you off. It's very, very different from standing at 20 yards, say in a building with no wind and perfect lighting. So I think it's really important to Prepare for your hunt in in your workouts in a way that you're going to have to perform there at your hunt. So prepare for your hunt by shooting at different uh, distances, levels, seated, standing, angles with a racing heart, things like that. And the way I do this, so I'll do my workout, which would be like a weighted workout with different, you know, kinds of weights, different muscle areas, a little bit of proprioception, a little bit of balance, you know, techniques. Maybe I'll use my acubo and do some of that stuff. But then my prepare like I'm there workouts are very different. What I do in my yard, I have a big hill. I have like no flat ground anywhere. The house is on the only part of flat ground they made. <laughs> and so what I do is I'll take all my stuff out to the back of the hill and I'll take a stool. I will go and I will do, say, 10 push ups, 10 squats. I'll run up one side of the hill, walk down the other, trying to catch my breath, come back to my spot, sit and take two shots immediately. And what I'm trying to do there is I'm trying to burn out my muscles a little bit. So I'm starting with 10 reps of, of those activities. And as I continue doing this workout and getting better at it, you'll increase your reps, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to kind of like burn out my muscles just a little bit. I'm getting my heart rate really going by running up the hill. And then as I'm coming down, I'm still using all my muscles and my cardiovascular system, but I'm giving it a little bit of a break, trying to slow down my breathing and my heart rate for the shot. Because when you're out in the field, you know, maybe you had to hike up the side of a hill because you're doing a spot and stock. So your muscles are going to be tired and burnt out. You're going to get to the top. Your heart's going to be racing. You're going to see, you know, whatever you're trying to harvest, your heart rate is going to go through the roof because you're so excited. Then you're going to have a very short period of time to decrease your heart rate to try and make a proper shot. Mm -hmm. And same goes for, you know, when you're in the tree stand, you know, you're sitting there, everything's really, really quiet. All of a sudden you hear some crunching, your heart starts racing, you turn, you look, there's a monster buck there. Your heart really starts ripping through your chest. And then you have only, you know, a short period of time to get your heart rate really under control so that you can make a proper and ethical shot. Yeah, I love that tip. And another thing about it is that it kind of, you know, it adds some excitement to your workout. You know, when you're you're working out, like thinking you're in the act of being out there hunting. Um, I don't know. That just sounds so exciting to me. Yeah, exactly. I, I had this new thought in my head, too, uh, for this year. Um, what I'd like to do is get one of those. I'm not sure if it's block that makes it who it is, but it's a round archery target a foam target with a string on it and i think it's like black and yellow so in my head i'm thinking how cool would it be to do like a quick circuit you know a bunch of exercises just a few reps run the hill get back down to the bottom of the hill grab your rope whip that little ball target out into your grass somewhere and then have you know you need to range it properly within two seconds and you need to make, you know, two shots within the next 10 seconds or whatever it is. Yeah. Just add another element to it. And that, you know, that makes it a little more real life, right? Hearts racing, like, 
something shows up and you have to make a good, you know, conscious, you need to arrange that and then you need to make an ethical shot on it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's super fun. I guess too, if, if, you know, if you don't have like the luxury of having like a nice outdoor area to do that in, then maybe there's some ways you can kind of mimic some of that with what you've got, you know, like if you, I, I don't know exactly how, like maybe you can't actually take shots, but like, you know, there's probably different ways you can get creative with it and just kind of get as close to your environment as you can. Yeah, for sure. Like if you say can't take shots in your yard, you know, maybe you live inside town and like here it's, you're not allowed to discharge a bow and arrow in town. It's illegal. So say you live in town, uh, something that you could do is if you had an acubo or if you had some exercise bands, uh, you could start at, say, the bottom of a staircase. Do, you know, 10 squats, 10 lunges, 10 push-ups, 10 burpees, a couple mountain climbers, run up the staircase, take your time coming down, and then, you know, draw. You could either draw with your acubo or an exercise band. You know, with an exercise band, you would just do the same motion and hold it, you know, in a full draw. And what you could do is sit steady, mm-hmm. you know, just, just sit steady and burn out the endurance in your arms. Uh, Cause you're going to be going like your, your breathing is going to be going crazy. So while you're in full draw, you know, you could be practicing decreasing your heart rate and your breathing rate while just staying at full draw and, you know, creating the endurance. And with the Acubo, you can actually like draw and release in a safe manner because there's no projectile. Wow. That's so cool. This has been so much fun where I can't believe we're already this to tip number seven. Um, I kind of hate to, to wrap it up, but, um, I appreciate, uh, you know, you sharing all this awesome information with everyone. Um, so with that tip number seven, stop comparing yourself to pros. <laughs> This is like one of my, while, while everything else that we've talked about is important, this is really important. (laughs) Um, and I feel like social media is a huge blessing for connecting people and, you know, making these groups, but it's such a curse in the sense that you see so much and we are always in the mindset of comparing ourselves to one another. And something that I, find myself getting caught up in is being upset when you see a professional hunter shoot, you know, a monster buck, this just big, huge buck. And I have to remind myself, like a lot of these professionals pay for their hunts who have a guide in a high fence that was maybe baited. And maybe those animals have had vitamins and minerals all year and they're growing massive horns. Where I'm from, we don't get that. Everything is completely free range. There's no fence. I have no guide. Baiting is illegal here. I've planned my whole hunt and I've executed my whole hunt. And so that to me makes it very different. And I have to remind myself to not compare to, you know, somebody who has the ability to pay for something fancy and well-guided and, you know, the guide takes the time to find the biggest animal they possibly can. I don't have the luxury of that. And I don't have a lot of things that, you know, some of the say American states are allowed to do. We're not allowed to do up here. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for everybody to just hunt their own hunt do your best and not compare yourself to anybody else. Just hunt your own hunt. Well, I think that's great advice and great advice in general, you know, just in general, try not to compare yourself to anybody on social media. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Social media is the highlight reel, right? Yes. totally. I mean, I, I show, you know, the, the grouse I hunted with, you know, my new short hair or, you know, the hunt I did with my dad, And I I don't show, you know, like my head down in the middle of the bush because, you know, my dog flushed up three grouse, you know, like we don't, we don't show that. And, and, you know, like we never show the work that goes into it either. Right. Yeah. Well, this has been just 
fantastic and uh i'm so happy that you know you agreed to come on the show and share all this great information i really encourage everyone to go look up huntress health on facebook you're also on instagram at huntress underscore health and i will put links to all those in the show notes as well as a link to where you can go and access these seven tips to increase your hunting performance. So you can download that and have that as reference as you start working through some of this stuff. Yeah. Just thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed talking about this stuff. All right, there you have it. I really hope you enjoyed this episode and found these tips valuable. If you did, please let us know. Email me at Angie at thewomanangler.com. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to go to the website and download April's free PDF. You can find the link to it by going to thewomanangler.com forward slash 35. And then you also find links to the Huntress Health Facebook group, website, Instagram, and all of that so you can get connected with April. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Barb has a chat with the super inspiring Northwoods woman who spearfishes for pike through the ice and handcrafts her own amazing looking decoys, among other things. See you then.